So I want to talk to you about some thoughts that I've been having around JavaScript and how it's been changing uh, the way that we develop and design software. I'm really glad that you came to, to see me because I was a little bit nervous that my audience would be a small audience as it is uh, usually. I usually give my talks like this on the street. But this guy is really excited about what I have to say. Um, I have a podcast, this is the advertising portion of the show, called Hansel Minutes. It's a very short podcast, it's only 30 minutes long, and it's for developers and designers and techies, and I would encourage you to check it out. I have another one that's called This Developer's Life, which is more about stories of developers and designers and techies, and you should check that out as well. And recently I talked about IoT and did a whole thing with my friend Saran called March is for Makers. We did this in March of this year and we did things like take apart Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and all that kind of stuff. So I'm always involved in tech in some way doing some kind of education. It makes me happy to do, uh, to do education and get people excited. Now I do work uh, at Microsoft. <laughs> but I don't have to apologize like I used to which is nice, it's, it's become improving, right? I actually work remotely for Microsoft, which makes it even better. So I'm on the forest moon with the Ewoks down here. We say I'm outside the Microsoft reality distortion field. I live in Portland, Oregon, which is uh, about four hours south of Microsoft. And this uh, prevents their mind control uh, from getting to me. And it also allows me to have a, an iPhone and a PlayStation, which is pretty. <laughs> Pretty cool. Oh, you like that? <laughs> so that's a little bit disturbing that that's the first thing you clap for, but uh, <laughs> yeah, now at least I know what I'm working with with the, uh, with the Finnish audience. I appreciate that. But I work in open source, which is better. This is a nicer Death Star, and it's made of Lego, which is Denmark, but still cool. Right? We like Lego. Um, when I went to work in, at open source, people said I was a sellout. And they said that I was uh, doing things for the wrong reason, and it made me very sad. But somehow I was able to comfort myself and find a way to get through it. It was quite difficult, because this is what I looked like before I went to work for Microsoft. And this is me afterwards. <laughs> so it's been a very nice uh, experience to work for Microsoft. It makes me very happy. Here's an org chart of uh, how we do our organizations and groups within Microsoft. This is, uh, we're, not, we're not technically supposed to show this org chart. <laughs> this is actually a cartoon that was created, but I think it's a little too close to home uh, that they, uh, there was an internal email saying, don't, uh, don't show this anymore. But I, I didn't see that email because Outlook was not responding. So <laughs> I'm going to use that anyway. And then <laughs> if my boss sees it, I'll say, I didn't see the email. Outlook's still not, uh, not responding. So I want to talk to you about some thoughts I've had around the cloud and the browser. Because there's all these cloud talks, and everyone likes to say cloud. And there's all these browser talks, but I think that we can put them together a little bit. I was at Intel in Oregon. Intel headquarters is there in, in Beaverton. And I was talking about the, the web with an older gentleman. And this gentleman was probably somewhere between 75 and 160. And uh, he was what we call a neck beard. Now, this is a gender non-specific role. If, you, if you've been doing software for 65 years, you get to be a neck beard regardless uh, of men and women. But this particular man, his neck had just formed into his entire body. The whole frontal area was all just beard. And uh, he wanted to know how to get on the internet. He's like, well, how can I be a web developer? And I was like, what are you talking about? Because you're like an Intel distinguished something. You've been, he's like Intel employee number nine or something. So I'm thinking, you've forgotten more about software than I will ever learn. And you're asking me about the web. And he says, well, I've been working on microcode. I've been working on the internals of the processor. I'm on the metal. He's just now, in 2015, stuck his head up and decided that the internet might be a thing. So I thought about, that's amazing. What, what could we teach someone if this is the first time that they'd ever thought about the web before? Think about this. Think about the web. Some of you may have been on the web 20 years, 25 years. Some of you may be 20 uh, years old, and that's unfortunate. But uh, 
I've been doing this for a very, very, very long time, and here's a person who skipped out on all the crappy parts of the internet. He missed out on all the one pixel transparent GIFs and the tables and all that crap. How would we teach someone the internet and what kind of websites and applications would they create if they skipped the 20 years of crap and they got dropped into 2015? So this is a picture of a selfie that he took just to give you a sense of how old this guy is. Very old man. And uh, so let's talk about the cloud. Um, this guy was really old. You guys know who that is, right? Okay, you better. All right, so there was a quote, uh, and this whole talk, not only does this talk have no actual content, um, but uh, mostly all the quotes are made up. Somebody said this, there's a world market for five computers. This is one of those quotes that you just don't know if it's a quote or not. I think it was like the head of IBM, Thomas J. Watson. But I can't find if he really said it or not. Uh, and I don't even have a picture of the guy, but I do have this really old book. So um, I'm just gonna say that was the guy. Okay, <laughs> so, so this guy, he said there's a world market for five computers. Now when he said that, he was talking about refrigerator sized computers, right? There'd be like the South American computer, right? And that would be one that you would send a batch job to. Each continent would have their own computer. And that changed, of course, when uh, Bill Gates said that everyone should have a PC. But the, the idea that there should be five or six of them really did happen, except they're not refrigerator-sized, they're cloud-sized. There's like the Azure cloud and the Google cloud and the bookstore uh, that's kicking our butt. And the, uh, you know, there's these different clouds, right? And there's like five or six of them. So the, the, the idea that there'd be these five um, elastic computers really did come true. It's just not quite the way that he thought it would. Here's a picture of the Microsoft Azure cloud. Now, I realize we're a little bit behind, um, but we got color just in the last release, uh, and we're feeling like we're going to catch you. Uh, we're going to get that bookstore. Here's a picture where we're unloading uh, a new update to Azure. It's going to be pretty sweet. He's really, actually, you know, there we go. <clears throat> He's really excited about that. It's going to be a good, good update. <clears throat> so I was trying to explain the cloud to this gentleman, and I said, well, let's think about it in the context of operating systems. What is an operating system? Now, the designers at this point may have been zoning out. They may think that this talk is boring. So if you're a designer, just think about why did I pick light blue, dark blue, and purple? <laughs> and then come up with a way to redesign that and tweet me the, tweet me the redesign. For the rest of you, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. This is, this is good stuff. Uh, does designers, if you have a designer sitting next to you, just poke him and say it'll get better. <laughs> Stay awake, it's gonna be good. These are the characteristics of what an operating system is, right? It contains memory management, it has threading and events. And then this older gentleman said, yes, totally, I know that. And I'm like, well, that's great that you know that. He's like, yeah, I wrote the book. Um, so I felt a little bit bad about explaining this to this, this person. But those are the characteristics of an operating system. Where things get interesting is when we virtualize those. When you pick up the operating system and you lie to it and you say, you're a real computer, and you pat the operating system on the head and you say, oh, you're just adorable. You're a real computer. But then you take him out of his universe and you drop him in another universe and he doesn't even know, right? It's like the matrix. They don't know that they're in a different data center and they move between data centers. The, the virtual machines don't know and care. Now, I asked this man at Intel, how do you get a virtual machine? And he said, well, I have to fax uh, IT. And then there's about a two-week wait, and there's some signatures and stuff, and that, that's how I get a, a virtual machine. It's like two weeks and a fax. I mean, that's ridiculous. Why don't you send a carrier pigeon or you know, uh, smoke signals? Like, how, how horrible is it that you can't just get another virtual machine? But he understood the concept of virtual machines, and I think everybody here does as well. And you can do crazy things with virtual machines, even if you want to potentially you know, run Linux on, on Azure, and Linus, uh, I don't have any animated GIFs of Linus, uh, but I do have uh, this guy. So you can go up, I'm telling this friend, up to places like VM Depot, and if I wanted to grab like this Ubuntu uh, virtual machine, 
it gives me the commands to create that. So in one line, I can go and type Azure VM create and then spin up at the command line an open source node project. It's got ASCII art, which is, again, for the designers to just keep you awake. And, and then there's a virtual machine in the cloud, and that's amazing. And he thought that was cool. I can make a virtual machine like that. That's the promise of the cloud. It's to get what you want without having to fax IT. That's the definition of the cloud. I've just made that a quote now. Scott says, the cloud is not having to fax IT. Now, when you do things with virtual machines, you have to manage it. Virtual machines are like a puppy. You know, you have to water it or, I don't know, I don't know anything about pets. Um, basically, keep it alive and run Windows Update is basically what I, if I had a dog, I would just run Windows Update as much as I possibly could. And you can run whatever makes you happy, even if it's like frickin' Erlang. If you wanted to run platform as a service that I'll talk about in a little bit, the cloud will manage the updates. That's the difference. If you do a Heroku or an Amazon or an Azure, the cloud's going to handle that. And you can run slightly fewer number of things. Um, it's more like borrowing a pet. Or if you have nieces and nephews, just bringing them over to the house and giving them sugar and then sending them home to their parents and, and enjoying that. I look at it like this. Virtual machines can be like your first car. You have to change the oil. You have to think about it. It has nothing to do with where you're going. I want to get from work to home and back. Why do I have to change the oil? Well, it's a virtual machine. It's your first car. There's things that are called cloud apps that are in a middle place where you don't have to manage the operating system, but you can still do anything, kind of like a rental car. And then limo is where platform as a service lives. So I was asking this man at Intel, do you want to think about virtual machines or do you want to think about platform as a service? I'm not a big fan of virtual machines, just like I don't have pets. I don't like having to manage the, uh, the operating system. I don't like it. Have you ever had that happen when you're typing in Windows and then your hand is up and then it's starting to come down to press enter and time slows down and the Windows update thing starts to come up <laughs> and the restart now button is the default button and you're like, no. But gravity has already grabbed your hand, and it's going to press restart now. So that machine is going to get restarted, and there's nothing you can do about it. It all happens really fast, and it just looks like, ah! But in slow motion, it's You know the only thing that can stop a Windows machine from restarting? Does anyone know? It's a dirty notepad. That. Ah. Right? You, Windows. Windows power some of the greatest, largest systems on the planet, but if Notepad needs to save, well, I'm sorry, we're not going to shut that down right now, sir. Not responding. Ah! When I was younger, I was the cloud. And by that, I mean the business person would say, we need you to scale out, and then they would go golfing because uh, that's what business people do, right? They wear suits and they golf. They would say, we need you to scale out, and I would have to go to the computer store and buy the computer, or three, and the memory, and install them all weekend long, and then on Monday morning, there would be three in the web farm instead of one, and then the boss would say, good job, pat, 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 pat. And he would say, the cloud is great. And I'm like, no, I worked all weekend to scale this out. And now, the cloud is a frickin' slider bar. And I say this as an old man who is bitter. Um, I don't know how you say it in Finnish. Uh, get off my lawn. Get all you kids with your... The kids with the cloud now will say, oh, I, I went to, from one to three on the slider bar and my whole website is scaling. It takes like ten minutes. Oh, this sucks. I used to scale in like a week. I had two pages of my resume, two pages of my CV dedicated to knowing how to scale a website. And now that is a slider bar. So I'm very angry. So old man shakes hand at cloud. That's me. 
But the man at Intel thinks this is great because he wants to write apps. He doesn't care about load balancing and, load ba and routers and networking. He just knows that my app got popular, so I want to scale out. So that's a really important thing that we take for granted. Like uh, some of you may remember installing the load balancer and you'd hire the consultant who would fly in and configure the load balancer and then he would say it's done and then you'd say, well, that, don't touch it. Just don't touch the load balancer. You might anger it. And then the consultant would leave and you'd have no idea. You just know that the site scales. Those days are over and it's all wrapped up in a slider bar. You can go out to the command line and scale stuff like that. And that's a miracle. It's an amazing thing. Blah, blah, blah. So I said, this is how it works. And he said, what just happened? And I said, it's magic. <laughs> I may come back to that every once in a while. I just think that's a great gif. That's good for anything. So then he says, well, what language should I should I use to talk to the cloud in? He's more of a C, C++ person. And I said, a good cloud doesn't care. Don't get involved in any kind of religious arguments about the cloud. Whatever religion that you like, this is the religion that you should, you should have. You should be happy about your religion. If your religion is Java or C++ or PHP, well, not, not PHP, but I mean, <laughs> if your religion is anything but PHP, then be happy with your religion, except if you're PHP, you're just wrong, and you're going to hell, and you're a bad person. But other than that, um, I'm just kidding. I love PHP people. <clears throat> uh, a good cloud doesn't care about the language choice. I told him, pick the language that makes you happy. Honestly, when I tell young people, when they say, what language should I learn? I say, learn JavaScript and some systems language, some back-end language, and you will always have a job. And even if that is JavaScript twice, then just learn JavaScript two times. That's totally OK. A good cloud lets you do anything at all. And he couldn't believe that. He thought that was amazing. He fainted. Good clouds are open source. They let you use anything you want. I like Azure because Azure is all open source and does a lot of stuff on um, GitHub. A lot of people don't know that Azure, 20% of Azure is Linux. 20%, no one realizes that. All of our SDKs, all of our command lines, all open source. That makes me happy. There's this guy again. I just wanted to throw him in again just because he's awesome. Now, I was at a conference in Malmo, Copenhagen, somewhere in Scandinavia. There were cobblestone streets. Could have been here. I have no idea. I'm American. We don't know these things. Um, and I was listening to a fellow named Adrian Cockcroft, who is, I think, English? Again, I'm American. I apologize. Um, but he was super awesome and charming, and he had a suit. So he got, like, plus two charisma just for showing up, right? <laughs> just for being awesome. He was the chief architect of Netflix. Okay, at the time, and he was giving a presentation, and he was talking about the distance between the business person, remember, remember the business person who said scale out, and the reality on the ground, and that the promise of the cloud, and why the cloud is significant, because a lot of people just say cloud because it's a fun way to say hosting, right? I mean, cloud is how hipsters say hosting. Young people don't even know how to say hosting. They just think everything is the cloud. Um, he was making a decision to switch Netflix from spinning rust, regular hard drives. If I can hear your hard drive, I don't trust you, because that's just a bad decision, you know what I mean? I always, hold my, I always hold my laptop up to my ear when it's doing something and working hard, and then I realize it's an SSD, I'm an idiot. So they were going from spinning rust to SSDs, and it was a business decision. Why was it a business decision? Well, there's this thing in the cloud called IOPS, input, output operations per second. It's basically a number that says how much input you can push into this particular device. This isn't an Azure thing or an Amazon thing. It's a cloud thing. So I think the deal was they were at Amazon, and it was like 500 IOPS for a dollar or something like that. And he discovered that they could go to SSDs and go from 500 IOPS to 3,000 IOPS for $3. So three times more for six times more perf. 
And he was explaining how they did that. It was a very business decision. And then afterwards, a young person, and I apologize for picking on young people, but this guy was probably 11, and you can't trust an 11-year-old web designer. Uh, the 11-year-old, or 25, either way, it doesn't matter, says, um, well, um, you know, I can't do a Danish accent, so I'll just do it like this. You know, and actually, SSDs are a bad idea because of high failure rates, and I think that it's probably a mistake for Netflix to switch over to SSDs because of the incredibly high failure rates. And he went on and on and on, basically telling the chief architect of freaking Netflix with plus two charisma and a suit <laughs> that you're an idiot for switching to SSDs. And this guy took it, man. He took it like this, like, you know, just like, you know, he just took the feedback. And what do you think about that, sir? And at the end of the whole thing, Cockroft says, well, that's not my problem, I'm renting them. Now, this is a technical conference, so I don't have a mic to drop, and he didn't have a mic either, he had only a lav, and he could like, but imagine if he had a tiny lavalier and he just dropped the mic and he was like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It, he, he destroyed this guy. He, the guy went on for like 10 minutes. It's, it's like, you know those kung fu movies when, and I have no physical ability anyway, but he was like with the, with, the, with the sword, the samurai sword, and the guy's head got cut off, but at an angle, and his brain started to slip down and then fall off, and the body didn't actually know what to do because it was dead. The guy just stood there. I have a gif. It was basically like this. It was the most amazing response that I'd ever seen. Now, I, I could keep that on loop forever, but I won't. What's significant about this is that at some point, you trust your cloud, and you raise the layer of abstraction to the level that the business person thinks. Now, I'm old. I can remember how to scale out. But if you don't remember, it's OK. You don't need to. You just know that scale out works, and you know about the ramifications of scale up versus scale out. That's the power and the promise of the cloud. In this instance, he made a business decision. This much more money, 3x, gives me 6x or 10x more perf. If every disk fails, that might be a problem. But let's say 20% of them fail. Would that be an incredibly high failure rate? Yes, it would suck. Is that his problem? Not really, right? He's in a rental car. He's like, in, it's like being in a hotel room, right? Like, I treat my house really well. That's my virtual machine. I have to go and clean my house, paint my house. It's my VM. But I've totally trashed the hotel that Reactor gave me. <laughs> I mean, they don't even know how screwed up this hotel room is. And I don't care. I'm renting it. You see what I'm saying? So you can level up and look at things from a, from a, from a dashboard perspective. You know, when they went into Europe, basically he pushed a button and like a new check mark appears over Europe. And it's like, oh, Netflix has gone to Europe. Let's all go to play golf or whatever people do. I don't know. But the dashboard view of things is where we should live now. A really high level sense of what's going on. Dashboards, like, well, maybe not that many. That's a little bit too much. Some of the young people are like, well, no, I've got a dashboard, right? Oh, I use this dashboard. I use top. That's the best dashboard ever. I'm old. Um, and then the other old person might be like, ah, use HTOP, it's in color. <laughs> that's, not, that's, like, that's not funny anymore, you know what I mean? That's like people who argue that these are the best dashboard ever are just wrong. Like, you know how when you meet people that are just so wrong, it's painful? Like someone tried to tell me that Mario was better than Luigi, and I'm like, you're an idiot. Like, Luigi is clearly better. Like, that's not even... Like, okay, no, <laughs> Luigi, you're an idiot. The, the level of abstraction that the cloud offers allows you to solve an interesting an, an, a kind of problem uh, without having to worry about the computer science of it all. And this is what was really exciting to the gentleman I was talking to at Intel, was that I gave him an example. Now, a while back, the New York Times had some interns, and the New York Times had terabytes and terabytes of these TIFFs, these big image files that were scans of like 150 years of the times. And they wanted OCR PDFs searchable of this stuff. And they said, hey, interns, go figure this out. How would you do that? That's a massive amount of information. Well, they would write a for loop, right? 
that's what everything is. That's all we know how to do anymore. So they write a for loop for each episode of the times in a for loop, and it's like a million of these things. That's the business problem. Hey, take these and OCR them. All right, for each in one million. Oh, wait a second. That's a big number. Now the business problem gets cluttered with the computer science of it all. Well, I could do multi-threaded stuff across multiple processors, and I could then slice the job to use different machines in the cloud. Blah, 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 blah. Whoa, 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 are you done yet? Well, no, I'm, I'm shaving this yak. Are you guys familiar with yak shaving? Right? Yak shaving is all the stuff you have to do before you do the thing that they asked you to do. Business person, hey, OCR, all these files. Well, I need to set up some systems in the cloud and then figure out how to do multi-threaded programming, and I need to pick a language because I'm not really sure that the language that I picked is the right language. Blah, 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 blah. I'm trying to shave this yak. When the yak is shaved, then I solve the problem. So some of the things that people are thinking about in the cloud are ways to, again, up-level the problem. Here is a way to uh, take something that's running in the cloud. This is just taking a text file and then adding something around that text file. This is just an example. You'll notice that there's no for loop here, though. There's no for loop. The for loop is implied. What we're coming up with is an idea that if a blob exists in a certain location in cloud storage, then call this function, and then write out the result there. And then it goes back to a slider bar problem. How much money do you have? Make the slider bar up to scale out, chop this job up. Suddenly this job goes from being a for loop over a million to becoming what we call naively parallel. Maybe I'll break it across a hundred machines and I'll do uh, uh, you know, a thousand at a time or whatever. What the New York Times interns ended up doing was getting a credit card and some cloud time and it cost them about 600 bucks. They did it over a weekend and then they shut it all down. So they slider bar up and they ran it and they slider bar back down. And the best part was that it turned out that it only cost them 300 bucks, they just made a mistake and had to do it twice. That is the promise of the cloud. It's that business person distance between the metal and the business person. And what's great about this for my friend at Intel is that he's getting to forget about the metal for a little bit and start getting to the original reason that we were writing software to solve stuff. So we talked about the cloud and I, he, he gets that, like there's any language, infinite scale, pick the stuff you want, open source, these are all characteristics of a good cloud. He understands that the cloud is about flexibility and elasticity and the idea that the business person's problem matches how that cloud thinks. But what we didn't talk about was the browser and how the browser has changed. Now remember this, have you redesigned it yet? Because I need to get this slide with some, something more than just purple and, and blue because it looks bad. Now there was a time when you would sit down in front of a computer that looks like this and you would talk to a computer that looks like that and you would go and you would hit a, you would hit a site and it, you would hit that site and it would appear on the screen over here except the work was really happening in the refrigerator. This is a dumb terminal, right? I'm worried that we're treating our web browsers and our quad processor 3D accelerated i7s like these dumb terminals. And when it comes time to scale, we get bigger refrigerators and we move cloud slider bars as opposed to letting these machines do a little bit of work. Now the World Wide Web, when it was first conceived of, was conceived of a series of documents like this. This is actually the first web page. This is the first one. This actually exists at the same URL. Uh, Berners-Lee put it back at the exact part, so when you want to show your family and friends where the beginning of the internet is, you show them that. It's amazing. And he's just a really cool person. If you ever feel like maybe you have understated your job title, <laughs> think of Sir Berners-Lee. True story, there is a gentleman named Heinrich Nielsen who works with me at Microsoft. And I didn't know this guy at all. I didn't know who the guy was. But I meet him in the kitchen. And we have a nice chat about the web and the way it's going and stuff like that. And then he walks away. And then I turn to my buddy, and my buddy's shaking like this. And he says, do you know who that was? Nothing good ever happens from a sentence that starts, do you know who that was? It's not going to be like, that was Beyonce. Whee! No you're gonna end up looking bad. 
So I go, oh crap, who was that? That's Heinrich Nielsen. He invented HTTP. Oh crap. So I go online and I look at the spec for HTTP and there's his name, boom, Heinrich Frisk Nielsen. And he was Berners-Lee's frickin' intern. And he works with us at Microsoft, he's on our team. So then later in the week, I see the guy in the kitchen and I turn into Forrest Gump. And I'm just like, definitely the internet. Def de good job on the internet. <laughs> and then he leaves and I turn into a normal person again. I cannot speak to this guy anymore because I know that he invented something amazing. So if I talk to one of you and you invented the internet or a part of the internet, just don't tell me and we will have a great chat. But I can't deal with it if you invented something amazing and important. It's bad. Uh, unless you invented Java and then I hate you. <laughs> so he made this thinking it would be pages that would be linked together, right? It was going to be an infinite book. And then this happened, right? And how did we know that that happened? Because we were browsing the web and then, so and then Java loaded. And then these guys were like, let's do it too. <laughs> and then these guys are like, we, oh, and yeah, he was like, that was a bad idea. And, uh, and these guys were like, uh, we've got YouTube. We still matter. And all this turned into were little virtual machines, plug-in virtual machines running inside of a browser. And they were good for nothing. Now, I have a, um, I have a Toyota. I have a Toyota Prius. We are assigned a Toyota Prius at birth because I'm from Portland, Oregon. Uh, we're very green. And I went to the Toyota dealership. And I was, I'm always the guy who's looking at your terminal, like if you're checking me in at the airport. And I'm like, hey, what do you got there? Uh, so I'm looking at the guy checking me in, and I notice that he's got a different system than he did last time. And I start out on, you know, on this side, and then by the end of the thing, I'm sitting next to him, and I'm like, really, tell me all about your system. Um, and he says, we got a new system, it's amazing. Uh, you know, it's not the VT100 text-based terminal that we have anymore. Oh, like, cool, man, let me see your new system. I want to see all the HTML5 goodness. So the guy fires up Windows XP, Oh, God. And I'm like, oh, I don't even want to tell him. And then he fires up Firefox, and then he goes and he opens a Java jar file, and Java's like, are you sure you want to run that? And he's like, yeah. And then Java's like, really? <laughs> and he's like, yes. And he types his name, you know, just make sure that the NSA knows he's running Java. And then he goes and he loads a jar file of a terminal emulator that terminals back into the same system, and then looks me in the eye with a straight face and says, this is way better than it used to be. Like, people don't even know that we've hurt them in this way. Do you, do you guys have the parable of boiling? Do you know how to boil a frog? Right? You, 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 the way you boil a frog is you turn the heat up slowly. Because a, a frog, if you throw them in hot water, they'll jump out. We're turning up the water on the boiling pot that is the internet, and uh, the people just aren't uh, educated enough to jump out. It's really sad. So they end up with these systems that are HTML and then a little tiny island of a virtual machine that's in some kind of a plug-in or something and then they, it's only good for teapots. Now Java on the server side is fine. I mean it's not PHP but it's fine. I'm talking about applets. I'm talking about plug-ins on the web that require you to do those kind of things. Now all the time that this is happening, JavaScript is also happening. JavaScript happening slowly. Don't do that, though. Java people hate that. So JavaScript, this is a flowchart of what it's like to work in JavaScript. <laughs> what? JavaScript. Um, JavaScript is coming up, and people are starting to do really cool stuff with it. But when JavaScript started, I thought it was just good for alert boxes that said, Honed. Like, that's what I thought JavaScript was for. But if you remember the first time that you realized JavaScript was good for something, I think we've all had this experience. We were working in web development, filling out a form, and then we put in our phone number, and we hit tab, and then the field turned red. And you went, mm hmm? And then you did it again, and you did it a couple times, and you bring up the sniffer tool, and you're like, I don't think it went back to the server, but it's validating my phone number. So then I rip my computer up and I'm running through the streets holding and I go up to my wife and I'm like, it's not posting back to the server. And she's like, I don't care. 
And then I tell my boss, it's not posting back to the server. It's amazing, right? That was the idea that you could do useful stuff with JavaScript. Client-side validation, that's where it all started. But then people start doing stuff like this, right? Commodore 64 emulator entirely in JavaScript. This exists. So what other crazy stuff could someone potentially do with JavaScript? Could they? Do, do, do. Let me find this thing. Where's Belod? Belod Linux JS. This is a complete version of Linux written entirely in JavaScript, emulating an Intel processor. How do you know that I'm not lying? You right click on it. Because if you right click and it says flash, then you say liar! <laughs> if anyone does anything hard on the internet, you have to right click on it to see if it's a plug-in. And then you're like, I've just lost all respect for you. That's not fair. Look, and then you select it to make sure you can select the text. And then you go, whoa, that's really JavaScript. So I went out to the command line, and I typed in this at a conference recently. And I used a C compiler to compile a C application inside of a JavaScript virtual machine and then run Hello World in a browser. And some guy in the audience said, TCC, why aren't you using GCC? You suck. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think you understand what I just did. I just ran a complete JavaScript emulator inside of you know, the browser. Let's make sure that my internet is still up here. Because I need to get rid of that. Hang on one second. So then, in order to get that guy to stop bothering me, I went and I started up, oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> I've been using this for like, this is my 15th, the 15th trial offline. Sorry, dude. Oh, for Pete's sake. <laughs> you ever do that? Just like stick it over here? <laughs> I am never going to pay you money. So then I went into an iPhone emulator, and then I compiled a C application inside of JavaScript and kind of an iPhone emulator running Safari on a Windows machine. And I just, screw you, GCC guy. <laughs> Why do people do stuff like this? It's because it's the internet, because it's awesome, because we want to see if JavaScript can do that kind of stuff, right? You can't disable JavaScript anymore. It'll kill you. This person made a game called Contre Jour that is a complete video game written in JavaScript. Contre Jour. I think I know how to spell Contre Jour. All in HTML5. It's this amazing app. It was actually the iPhone app of the year in like 2013. And the guy who wrote it said he would not allow anyone to release a JavaScript version unless he could guarantee that it was going to be perfect and pixel perfect. It's the complete game, and the part that I like is to zoom in on the grass, just to like see what's going on in there. It's got physics, it's got touch, it's got all this stuff. It's absolutely amazing. It, this is what I do when a boss at work says, I don't really know if JavaScript is really mature enough for what we're doing in our very important business, where we have text boxes over data. Now, this may be the part in the talk where you think, I think Scott's probably going to run Quake in the browser. No, no. Then maybe I'll talk about how you can take C++ and run it through Clang and then through Inscriptum and then use things like Asm.js and then run that in the browser and how amazing that is and what a technological achievement it is to run C++ that's running in the browser as JavaScript. No. I'm not going to do it because it's too easy. It's too easy. Take this diagram. The original one that describes the characteristics of a virtual machine, the characteristics of an operating system, and put characteristics of JavaScript over the top of them. And you could theorize, you could 
postulate, you could lie and say that JavaScript's an operating system, right? It's the virtual machine that we don't have to install. It's the one that doesn't require plugins. It's a full OS with all the characteristics like threading and events and networking and APIs that let you do what you want to do without having to run any kind of virtual machine, because you kind of already are. It's the one that we, it's not the operating system that we need, but it's the one that we have, shall we say. Now, Jeff Atwood and Atwood's law is that any application that can be written in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript. Uh, this is unfortunately true, uh, but it's not something that you can use to prove th uh, that JavaScript is the most important uh, thing right now, because I'm afraid it's also true of Microsoft Excel. This is uh, a complete pixel-perfect implementation of Pac-Man written as an Excel macro where each individual cell is a pixel. The problem is, it is so perfect and so wondrous and so glorious that it can't actually be stopped. Or apparently started. Looks like it's time to blow Excel away. Oh, it's not responding. I'm going to blow a few other things away. That's Atwood's law. But it turns out, though, that it's really true because you have another additional operating system on your pocket supercomputer, right? I've got a quad processor here, and I've got accelerated graphics, and I've got two operating systems, the one in Safari that runs JavaScript and the one outside that runs iOS. Now, Mark Zuckerberg says that it was a mistake to bet on HTML5, and maybe it wasn't ready to go. But he was wrong because just after he said that and went back to using native applications for JavaScript, the folks at Sencha.js showed how their framework can implement the Facebook application and be very, very fast. It just meant that his programmers weren't really good at doing what they needed to do. JavaScript gets better every single day. Now, there's a really great philosopher who said, the avalanche has already begun. It's too late for the pebbles to vote. What a great freaking quote. Like, it's very evocative. Like, the, the giant snowball is coming down the mountain of HTML and JavaScript, and everyone's like, is this really a good idea? You're a pebble. You don't count. Who said that? Do you guys know what famous person said that? You're all nerds. You should know this. No? OK, it's Kosh from Babylon 5. <laughs> what kind of bunch of nerds? I suspected that you would not know that, which makes me disappointed not just in you as nerds, but also in you as a country. <laughs> because it wasn't actually Kosh. It was this guy. But I respect the, uh, the attempt. Very wise man. Used a lot of JavaScript. People don't realize that. Yeah, yeah. He also said that the funny thing about quotes on the internet is that you can't really be sure of the validity of those quotes. Also, get going in. Now, when we say HTML5, we're really talking about HTML and CSS and JavaScript. When people say, hey, I'm going to do that in HTML5, they're really talking about the the collection of all of those things. This is getting a little bit complicated, though, and I think that everyone who uses HTML5 realizes that there's no HTML5 for dummies book. It involves tools and tool sets and backend and databases and all that stuff. The amount of stuff that we need to know to work on these is a little bit overwhelming. Uh, to be a web designer is extremely difficult. I'm just making sure the web designers are still awake. This is how you dress, right, in Finland? Um, now, there was a time, though, when all you needed to know was HTML. In fact, you could get a job knowing only tables. This is true for the young people who don't realize that. I was actually homeless. Someone said, do you know tables? And I said, yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> Boom. Web, web developer. Just like that. But then they said, do you know Rosepan? Senior. Senior developer. Just like that. That's how quick it was. That was, all, that was the most complicated computer science task ever. True story. It's true. But now HTML is simpler than ever. I've seen web pages that are just a div, just because people wanted to do them. Who's doing the work, right? It's in JavaScript. It's in CSS. HTML is just that structure. CSS provides the color and the style in JavaScript. And CSS, by the way, is an amazing tool that everyone loves. It's an expressive language that allows you to do whatever you want in an intuitive fashion. I can't, everyone here loves CSS. You always get it right the first try, right? Everyone understands the box model and flex. Very intuitive. Everyone likes CSS. And then we use JavaScript for everything else. 
I've got a, a picture of me the very first time that I learned to use JavaScript and how, how it made me feel. <laughs> and the great thing about JavaScript now is that you don't even need to learn the bad parts. Just the good parts. JavaScript's great. This is a book by John Resig who wrote jQuery called Secrets of a JavaScript Ninja. That is a samurai. Ninja, samurai. I asked John Resig about this and he said it's okay because JavaScript has loose typing. Thank you. <laughs> someone else said once that JavaScript is the assembly language of the web. Who said that? Which one of our wise philosophers said that? Me, in fact. I said that. Uh, someone came at me on Reddit and said uh, that was BS, that it's not really the assembly language of the web. So I went and I asked the developer, the inventor of JavaScript, Brendan Eich, and he said, that is actually Brendan Fraser. That is Brendan Eich, but uh, Brendan Fraser's pretty. Um, so we'll keep him up there. He said JavaScript is the x86 of the web. It's is actually happening, and now WebAssembly is happening. JavaScript is the assembly language of the web. It is the virtual machine. This is happening, whether you agree or not. This is great. WebAssembly has been a joint effort, which is fantastic. Everyone is excited about that. You can do amazing stuff, even if you don't want to write JavaScript. CoffeeScript is what Ruby people wish JavaScript was. TypeScript is what C-sharp people wish JavaScript was. Each of them compiles into idiomatic JavaScript. But you shouldn't let layers ha um, hide too much complexity. Sometimes people get a little bit slick. They think they're cool with their new library, but they're not. <laughs> we'll do that one again. This is, that's amazing. Yeah, hey, looking like jQuery's great. Boom. Um, the browser is the virtual machine, but now here's the problem. You interview someone and they say, well, no one writes JavaScript anymore. They write jQuery, right? You know who said that quote? That was Jake Weary. <laughs> the best part about telling you about Jake Weary is that I've ruined Jake Weary for you. At, at, your next, at your next work, uh, at your next development meeting, you're going to say, should we use Jake Weary for this project? <laughs> and, and one of you is going to say, I don't know, is he available? <laughs> this is his IMDB page. He's done some pretty amazing stuff, including uh, zombie beavers. <laughs> so you start thinking you're going to write these things in JavaScript. You have an image in your mind about the thing you're going to write, and it's going to be amazing. And it never turns out right, and you don't know whose fault it is. It's really, really sad making. It's overwhelming. I don't even know. <laughs> Consider using things like vanilla JS, right? I think it's so funny that people have all these amazing JavaScript frameworks to start, start from, but when someone starts a startup, the first thing they do is they write a JavaScript library because your text boxes over data are so unique, so special. Your insurance company is different than everyone else that has ever been on the internet, ever. I'm going to skip past this because I'm out of time, blah, 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 but it was amazing. Let me just tell you, <laughs> it was awesome, that whole section there, but I'm kicking it out. Blah, 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 woo, ah. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. Just remember that part with fondness and it'll be okay. We need to expect more from our web tools. Things are starting to fit together well and clean, and not just this seamless GIF. Other seamless GIFs work. What I want you to remember when you think about the cloud, when you talk to your bosses, when you teach people, is that the cloud is about massive scale and elasticity, your choice of languages. But on the browser side, your browsers are way more powerful than you realize. Your quad processor phones are way more powerful. Everyone has accelerated graphics now. The Canvas, the WebGL, all of these things are incredibly powerful. You have a complete integrated virtual machine available to you, but we continue to click in a grid to sort data and send the request back to a server because apparently Intel processors can't like sort a table of like 100 items, you know. It's ridiculous. How often are you still doing that in 2015, sending that back to the server? It's horrible. Remember that your user has a virtual machine and you can write JavaScript, or if you don't want to write JavaScript, target it. Use CoffeeScript, use TypeScript, use Ildasm, use Clang, use whatever makes you happy. So get out there 
and put the user's virtual machine to work. It is also part of the cloud. If you have 10 virtual machines in your farm and 1,000 users visiting you, you have 1,000 plus 10 virtual machines. Make their computers work, and it'll make your cloud not work so hard. Thank you very much. You are powerful. You know how to do the cloud. Get to work. Thank you very much.